definitely the LEC does need cleaning up, mate. Like, it is actually the messiest league in the whole world right now. Like, you would think of the other leagues. You still have, like, Team Liquid and LCS. You have, like, Gen G in Korea. Bro, as this upper bracket final, let's just start there. It was obviously the game everyone was hyped for. But, bro, it actually delivered for once. Do you know how you know how sick and tired I am of Fnatic? In English, the saying is, flatters to deceive. As in, they look like they're getting really good. They look like, hey, they've got... The, they're the only team with the force and the fire and the players the names Razor Cumulo they're, they're the only team that can take G2 on but we all know it's not even just the story of this lineup it's pretty much the story of the post Caps era they always either come that close and lose or they just get blown out those are the only two results I actually can't believe that I just saw a series where one there's actually a world where Fnatic could have been the ones blowing G2 out here and then two it was actually Fnatic that came through the really close series so can I finally believe Zabatine? Is this the time? I mean, they've been saying all the interviews, you know, if we're ever going to beat G2, it's now. If we're going to win the league, it's got to be now. Is it now? It, it, can it be now? Can it be now? Please tell me. Uh, it's, I feel like it's, uh, it's a little uh, overshot to think that they are like the best team. in. Uh, they're currently the best team. I think that uh, they are definitely have shown that they have way more sports pragmatism better draft, just way more win condition in their draft. And I think G2 is kind of going through uh, figuring out what, how they want to play on, on this very new way. Like the League of Legends that Freak, Freak has brought after MSI has been very, very weird. I think most of the teams in the world that are, don't have like super, super top-notch players really struggle to figure out how they want to play the game and G2 is part of them. Uh, but I feel like it felt so great to see G, uh, Fnatic win game three because usually you know that's the scenario. It's like... Game one, G2 like smashes to Fnatic, and then there is the game two where G2 drafts something that's very whack and doesn't sure. work at all, like very like, you know, walking on thin line and they just make like this one small mistake at like seven minutes and the game's over. And usually they, they get their shit together on game three and they smash Fnatic 3-1 or 3-2. And it felt great to see Fnatic getting two, you know, two decisive games after game three. And we saw that like G2 struggled heavily to, to catch back on, on Fnatic. That said, I feel like if G2 stopped drafting really random stuff in the top lane and just play a little bit more with classic win conditions, I've seen them way more dominant during the first 15 minutes of the game overall in the series, which have been very like overshadowed from the narrative because people take the result and try to explain it. But if you look at the process of the series, G2 facing Fnatic and, and and having these early game skirmishes, it's eight times out of 10 for G2. The problem is they drop the ball, especially on the top side later in the game, or just BB just didn't play. Like, I mean, he plays very stuff. Like the, that shit doesn't work, I think. I don't know, like I, I, I was, when I watched the series, you know, I was thinking about what Dom said about not watching LEC. I was like, this is a joke, man. Like, why would they go for that and lose the series on being so stubborn at picking champions they're not good with when you know that they could just pick on or anything like Renekton yes. for BB and just win the game, right? <clears throat> You know, this that is one of so the problems weird. I have, Zabatin. I'll jump in here. So what I'll say is this. I really did come into this episode after Fnatic 1 thinking, right, I've got to actually, for once, normally my mood would be, right, it's easy Fnatic, you can't win. Since it was a 3-2 and those games were really drawn out and it was hard work to win. The obvious angle I'll just do is G2 didn't play that great, so who cares that Fnatic won? But the problem is since Fnatic never, ever wins these matches normally, I do have to give them a bit more props. But even so, I've got to shade a little bit of hate towards G2. And it's along the lines you're saying, which is, bro, if we just take this VOD, I feel like this VOD review takes five minutes for the whole series. Here's all you do if you're Dylan Falco. You go, Broken Blade, whoever it was out of me and you who did this draft for what matchups and what champion pool we want for top lane, I wish we could just go back in time and just play the obvious meta champions. Because if he just does the most obvious cynical draft ever for top lane in this series, surely they just win 3-2 or 3-1, you know what I mean? Like, it felt like Broken Blade mega overcooked these picks. And then what he did with them in the game as well. Like, he, like normally people complain that Broken Blade gets carried or he didn't have... Bro, remember, MSI, he actually was looking pretty good. That was actually, like, pretty good form from him. He looked that he got... He, if anything, he was the one with all the Rex eye picks and all that weird shit. Like, I feel like top lane is absolutely we got to start where this series was lost, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And what's very, I think that the explanation for that is uh, in screams. I think that players have cer a certain amount of patience in screams and playing versus Veristop or playing versus this like marksman 
feels miserable as a top laner. And I'm pretty sure like right. a lot of like their opponents didn't uh, respect the options of the marksmen on the top side and were trying to brawl against them. They created massive leads in screams, very successful, something like 85, 90 percent so... win rate, which is kind of normal if you play against a disrespectful team that try to challenge these marksmen early in the game because they don't want to be patient. You're gonna get this 85 percent win rate. But when you come on stage and you have Oscar that like has been on the weak side duty for pretty much 80, 89, 90 percent of the of the year. He's going to play this kind of safe style and say, see you in mid game, see you at 25, see you at 30. And G2 is not a team that's exempt of like drawbacks. I think that they have pretty poor objective contest. I think they strategically, I think BDS, not the one of this split, but the one of the two previous split is way better, better at maneuvering around the neutral objectives. So you see that a team that has flows and has the, 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 the habit of making hoopsies in games, drafting these like three marksman drafts and thinking that the enemy is just going to bleed 5k goal every game was a little bit optimistic. And I think that's fake data. Due to, due to playing screams with this type of draft that like there are champions that will give you bad bad data from screams and it's like Lucian back then Olaf in the jungle and I think this marksman top the, the the TF and the and the virus are giving you exactly the same type of data it's like oh but guys we have 90 percent win rate with virus what went wrong I mean the champ is not a great top laner guys like it can work sometimes but it's not if you if you lose one fight in the game you're gonna feel miserable for the rest of it I also feel like another reason to me it's a bridge too far. It's like, bro, we're getting games now where there's five ADCs in the game. Like, because I'll say this to Monty. I actually also find team fights really bad to watch in this meta where everyone has like dual ADC, like the mid and the ADC. Like, because the problem is your eye, I've always thought in League, a flaw the game has as a spectator sport. I've always said the reason Counter Strike works in esports is you can actually be someone who doesn't play CS, but you can in appreciate the basic aesthetic. In League, I always Say, dude, even when you follow League, I've always said that uh, years and years ago, people did that thing on highlight videos where some people would stop the action and highlight, this is who you're meant to watch, watch the vein. And I always found like, dude, that's a million times better for like a replay. Because the worst thing about a replay of a team fight in League is... In the old 5v5 one, you at least knew, right, so I'll watch the mage when they burst the damage, and then I'll watch, like, the ADC to see if he gets caught, see the team fight. There was, like, a logic and a priority, like a protocol you could put of who to watch. Dude, in this current meta where someone's playing, like, Ezreal with Tristana against fucking Kaiser, and, like, bro, what am I watching? I'm just watching loads of people shoot each other. Like, this is really hard to enjoy as, like, a casual, I feel like. And it makes the team fights also, bro. They're so, like... Fuck, the variance feels crazy in these team fights because the think about it, your health bars are just going because it's just loads of people doing loads of auto attack damage. Like, oh, it's fucking bonkers. I find this meta really messy, mate. <laughs> no, it's not it's not pleasant. And it's very it's very curious because I feel like Riot with the durability patch last year or, or two years ago, I don't know, like the times go times flies. Uh, there was there was kind of a, a, a drastic measures to reduce the, the damage yes. overall in a way that like burst doesn't exist that much. Yes. And since uh, I think Freak went to the balance, I think he has reverted a lot of change, uh, changes that went into that direction to make League more fun, right? I think the item changes early in this year and now like the changes they've done to the marksman items and the return of the BF, you know, 1300 goals with like 50 damage on it, which was kind of a, a cornerstone of League of Legends for like pretty much eight years from, from the, 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 the birth of the game. And, and he went back to it, which I think felt great for most of the a marksman player. The problem with that is you're taking something, a relic from the past and putting it into the game that has been drastically shifted in terms of tempo, in terms of uh, mid lane impacts on the way we play the game, right? Jungle support and mid lane going to silence, diving. This is not the same game anymore. And the, the, the this step back from like uh, pretty much four or five years in terms of design has tremendously affected the way the way people play the game because I don't think the mage items are like even bad either. It's just this this way of like you buy two marksman item with a marksman and then nobody can challenge you is, is terrible for the game. And you start to see, right, if you look at the series yesterday from K-Corp and you, you start to look like in, even in China and Korea, what's happening is it's a lot of poke that's coming back. Why is Poke coming back? Because when the damage is too high, the only thing that dis that, that differentiate teams is range. Yes. And you start seeing these Poke champions, like even Zyra is kind of a Poke champion. Sure. So it's a lot of nuke and pokes. And it doesn't feel great to watch because whoever makes the smallest mistakes just dies. And these teams like get massively a five or six K and one guy makes a mistake and it's immediately lost. And, and then there's Baron and the siege feel endless because ADC have so much AD damage. So they clear even though despite Baron. So the 
length of game starts to explode. And I feel like I understood that in June, right, or early July, the state of the game was this way. What I do not understand is Riot standing on their ground, dying on this hill of keeping these items with this type of power trough that's completely polarized the game and feels it feels degenuine to play even as a solo queue player. But watching competitive, I'm completely on your side. It feels it feels miserable to watch because like right now there is the LFL playing, there's yeah, there is five ADCs in the game. That's that's completely stupid. Another thing I wanted to ask, because we can use this G2 series actually as a great example, is I think an angle people are missing about G2 Zabatinas. It's funny when people watch T1, they can immediately see not a great meta for Guma Yushi, right? Because it's none of his champions. Dude, it's the same thing with Hansama. If you think about what Hansama likes to play, there's not, I mean, the joke is, if anything, he should be on the Varus. That's like his fucking champion, but his bloody top lane is playing it. I feel like if you think about what everyone's loving right now in ADC, it's not really a Hansama meta. Like, I feel like actually that's an angle where. If you'd asked someone earlier in the year, like, it, with no context, who's better, Han Sama or Noah, everyone would just say Han Sama, right? Dude, Noah's actually sort of, like, thriving in this meta, actually. He's, sort of, he's having a little bit of a glow up. I was kind of down on him around MSI, mate. Like, I feel like the Han Sama factor's gone away a little bit. And for me, in this, in G2, I have always thought of it as, it's obviously a Caps team, but then the other carries Han Sama, clearly. They've always used Broken Blade as more of, like, a wild card element or depends on the pick or the matchup. Like, a lot of people will know a lot of the times in lane, he could just cruise. They just had to be useful in the team fight. Like, I feel like, once you take on Sama away, they get less powerful G2. There's not that dangerous a team. I'm thinking, whenever I think of the last two years of a really great game, unless it's a, a, a cap solo carry, it's nearly always a Han Sama masterclass, you know, 19 minutes clean up a whole team fight or skirmish or something. He's a, he's a laner. Like, like Han Sama is one of the few ADCs in Europe that actually want to play the lane, they want to skirmish in lane. I think that like he's a Draven, he's a Kadista player. He likes to play on these champions that like get priority. And G2 special for the longest time has been very inspired, I think, from from T1, which is get prio in, yes. in the bot side, get something on the first on the first clear of the jungle. He may invade level two, level three, execute the first dive, and then free the support that goes with to the with the jungle and kind of take over the map with with the mid laner. Caps is very good at playing around the side lanes. The problem is. The this has been uh, become predominant. Every team started playing that way, meaning you had the prior on the on the matchup on the first three waves, and you would get a freebie pretty much in enemy jungle, right? The blue side going, and the jungle does like red raptors and goes to enemy gromp. And as a defender, it feels miserable to play, and you saw the blue side having massive win rates because of that. So what did the team do? they decided to go into swap lane and then swap lane got nerfed to a point where no you would assume you would lose around 500 gold and a lot of xp on your top laner to just play it to swap lane but still exist and i think this is the first meta in the last two years and a half i would say maybe even three years that mid to bot is not the, the way to play in the in league of legend and that hurts tremendously the, the play style of, of g2 that has this laner that want to play the 2v2 bots to free the support by getting prio and get the lean to the jungle and no it's not that it's a lot of like chilling in the bot lane farming your cs the support goes immediately and leave the ADC in 1v1. You see supports being minus three, four, five levels behind the ADCs in this meta and trying to play skirmishes around mid and top, right? A lot of like skirmishes around the, 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 the objectives and the solo lanes. This is the worst possible meta for Hansama. He has to play these Zeris, these Jinx, these Caitlyn's, playing 1v1s, not being able to get a single edge on their opponents. And then I don't think that Hansama has ever been the best team fight ADC in the league. He no, has been no. matched by a lot. Like in Europe, yeah. we have a lot of uh, culturally very good team fight ADCs. Even Kobe back in the days, you know, like was really good at it, reckless. Like that's how that has been the place. Like Patrick, uh, Kazi is that way too, right? Kazi, yeah, exactly. Probably one of the best. And and so you're asking, right, to uh, to to you have someone that's a striker and some at, at this point he has to play like a midfielder and yes. you feel like he feels lost. And I think that G2 now has to play around BB, but BB wasn't that playstyle either. And so that's why I was saying with this meta, you clearly see that G2 is trying to figure out how to get lead in early game because in terms of mid game objective contest. You clearly see from this series, they are not any better than any team. The, the best in the in LEC, I would say, over the year has been BDS. Right now, they are they're kind of they're kind of shit. Let's be honest. But over over the month, I think BDS has been the best. And G two is just we go on Baron, and someone's gonna do something, or we're just gonna flip it, and that doesn't really work. 
if you don't have your play style and your goal lead from the beginning of the game, and that right now you clearly see that they have no idea on how to create it. Yeah, all I would say to cap the G2 discussion is like this. I think actually, even the way they lost this series to Fnatic, it explains why they got to this point of making these mistakes and going down these weird paradigm paths. Because if you think about it, right, Fnatic still barely beat them. Like one of the best qualities that they have, G2, is they can still always play from behind. Like it never is the case that they're like, you know, someone has the 3K gold lead and you're like, well, that's that game over. There's no such thing against G2. They're always able to find a fight or pick someone off or play aggressive on a, a moment or trade on something so you can see I, I get the vibe that like they they probably really never did have a scrim session they lost guys or they were always in it or they lost a couple but they were like they knew the reason why I think the real problem G2 has had is they are just shadow boxing themselves meanwhile if you go on the Fnatic side if we talk a bit about Fnatic as I say all past discussions of can they win the league were sort of a waste of time because they could never beat G2, so it just didn't matter. But they've done it now. They have actually done it now. Now, even though there are still plenty of angles that you could probably diminish Fnatic with, there are some obviously good ones. Like, I'll tell you what, if you were going to change the meta to hurt or help a team... Bro, this meta looks awesome for fucking Razork. He already was the best, in my opinion, anyway. He's one of the few people in Europe and the West I do trust to play in Niddly or to actually not fuck up the Zyra, etc. Like, dude, I actually think a lot of the... And by the way, Noah seems like he's loving this champion pool at the moment right now. It's all right in his back. But that fucking Caitlyn game, it was his dream. That was about the best you could ever hope for. What do you think of the Fnatic chances? Because in theory, we have, to, we have to now imagine a world where it's not impossible they could do this again. They could, they could win the league, maybe. Yeah, I mean it's it's possible. I feel like G two now has really has real information on on their priority in draft and the choices. They have one more series, and I don't see the winner of BDS versus KC BG two in a BO five later on. Maybe I don't know. BDS beats KC, upsets G two because they find themselves back, and then you have the Fnatic versus BDS in final, which I think like BDS uh, Fnatic would be uh, favorite for, but. Um, I think that, yeah, Ra Razork, you said it. I mean, he's been the best jungler over the last two years. I think Yike, people overestimate a little bit what Yike does, even although he's a really good jungler. Yeah, yeah. But I think that Fnatic, in Fnatic, Razork is just finding all the leads in early game. And it's been the case since Misfits. Everywhere he's been, every every laner just feels like they play better at the game. Uh, he just finds all these weird pathing, well creative angles. He plays carries, he plays tanks, he, he can sacrifice for the team. He's the best jungler by a, a landslide for nice me in, in Europe. And and I feel like yeah, and and a lot of the the, the bad things about Fnatic, which is I don't think Noah is that any any not great in lane, and we saw it right during international events. Yep. I think that Oscarinin is kind of like a tank duty or bruiser duty. Everything aligns, right? All the planets align. So if G two cannot figure out how to fix uh, their approach of the game and deepen less on the bot prio, and they come back. And they still like play this weird uh, range top, and they don't accept to kind of adapt to Fnatic's playstyle. Fnatic can take it, but I would still say like the odds is seventy thirty for G two. Like it's still a three two. It's game one. It was a sweep, absolute sweep. Game four was kind of a sweep too. So you see, like if they don't have the perfect, like, if the planet don't align, G two wins. And I think it's pretty hard to do it twice see more cool funny interesting clips based on topics from my content well subscribe to this channel then or you know be a pleb and don't